Good evening. We're going to try something this evening. I've broken up this talk into two parts because when I explored and rethought the problem of Neoplatonism and the Elizabethan age, I realized that it's necessary to give the background drama of Neoplatonism. So I thought this evening I would bring you up to date with the background drama going on in England and Europe and the crisis that occurred and I chose to call it the light that failed. Now, I was going to add an extra phrase and say, but we can keep what they reject. So here we go. All right, now we play. First, it's necessary to get an idea of a whole volume, a flood nearly, of literature coming into the Europe in the Renaissance. And so I set out what I think of the essential traditions and works that were part of that flood of literature that came into Europe. Now, this material was not seen in any way as in competition with Christianity. And that's essential to keep in mind. Christians at the time, both Protestants and Catholics, saw this tradition that was coming to them as returning Christianity to its roots. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting to get a picture of Europe during this period of time, and especially at the time before this literature hit Europe. They were isolated. They could walk amid ruins and realize that the ruins in many cases were more beautiful than anything they could construct in the aqueducts and the roads. They were clear evidence of greatness in their past, and they wanted some way to get back to it and continue that. Therefore, the first interesting uh, material that came in, came in from the Arabs of Haran in the 12th century, which is called the Pedactrix literature. Now, we haven't yet talked about this, but we will later at some other time. We have talked about the writings of Dionysius, later called Pseudo-Dionysius, and those letters and his writings created the foundation, oh, found with a D, foundation of metaphysics. Next, there was also the Chaldean oracles. The Chaldean oracles were said to be of such an inspired and intellectual set of writings that if all of Plato's writings were lost, they thought it would be possible through the Chaldean oracles to reconstruct the entire thing. Now we've given talks on these two and Asclepius' Golden Ass which includes the exploration of the mystery of the Egyptian mystery cult of Isis. And now what we're going to look at tonight is a special tradition that came into Europe called the Hermetic literature that came into Europe and created quite a stir and brought the promise of reestablishing Christianity on the most profound foundation. Now, there were echoes of this before the material came in in the 15th century. Michael Spilius, a, a Greek, a very famous Greek in the 11th century, was able to get some of this literature and he was able therefore to present it, preserve it, bring it together, annotate it. But it wasn't until Ficino, and Ficino was the great translator of classic literature in the 15th and the 16th century. 
It is to Ficino that we owe the translation of the Hermetic literature, the first major translation. <coughs> now, the Hermetic literature basically is 16 or 17 writings, and he translated it. Now, Ficino was a, uh, started the great academy in Florence, where there was a translation center, and he was under the Cosme, Cosmio and uh, de Medici's and he funded it, and he ordered Ficino to translate the writings of Hermes Trismegistus first, and to translate Plato and Plotinus later. Now, when this literature, the, Herm the Hermetic literature, especially what we're now going to call Hermes Trismegistus and Asclepius, when they were translated and available in print, it went through 16 editions. It was extremely popular. It created quite an impact on European thought. Then it was no longer reprinted, and the silence came in. Now, what's the mystery behind this? I'd like to talk about the mystery behind this, and that's where we're going now. Here's the mystery. Lactanius and St. Augustine, both fathers of the church as they call them, both accepted, both accepted a very interesting thesis. And that is that the Hermetic tradition, especially Hermes, Trismegistus, was contemporary with Moses. And therefore, he had an inspired teaching that paralleled, that paralleled the writings of the Gospels, pardon me, of the Bible. And this was revealed teachings based upon faith. And this was revealed through reason. And since they both had a common source, Moses, it was thought then that Trismegidius the great wise man was a contemporary of Moses, and so were many of the other classic Greek uh, wise men. And therefore they met and discussed and generated two traditions, one rational and one revealed based upon belief and faith. Well, I'd like to just point out that I'm going to be reading from two books tonight. One is Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, a really great book by Francis Yates. So I'll just read a couple of quotes for a moment to anchor you into some thought. Lactanius placed Hermes Trismegidius when he says that Trismegidius is more ancient than Plato and Pythagoras He thought that Hermes was a valuable ally in his campaign of using pagan wisdom to support the truths of Christianity. Why did they date Trismegidius so much with Moses? Because of the similarities and affinities with the Genesis. And when Lactanius, who is the uh, second century father of the church, and St. Augustine in the fourth century of the church, they both agreed with this model. Therefore, from this point on, this model was accepted as genuine, and therefore, a person could be rational and naturally accept the Bible, accept the Bible and naturally accept reason, since they were two traditions that have the same root.
Now, I have to be careful about reading because I get involved in my reading, so I got to stop that for a minute. Um, now, for Pacino, the great translator of all of Plato, who was later a canon of the church, by the way, for him, he went so far as to say that Hermes was Moses. He didn't study with him. It's one and the same person, since the similarity in the writings of the two are so close. This was distant, old, pure, went back to the holy roots of Christianity. Now, was it accepted? I'm going to read from uh, four bishops and uh, Patrizzi's concept of a new philosophy that emerged in Europe, so you can see how well this was accepted once it was translated. Then I'm going to jump into the text. All right. So therefore, let me jump into show you how well it was accepted at the time and the promise that it made. Um, here we go. Got the wrong place. Okay. Ah, there we go. François de Foix of Candale, the Bishop of Air, reaches new heights of ecstatic religious hermeticism. In 1574, he published another edition of the Greek text of the Hermetica. He thinks that Hermes attained to a knowledge of divine things surpassing that of the Hebrew prophets, equaling that of the apostles and the evangelists. He lived in an earlier date than Moses and must truly have been divinely inspired. I'm just going to hit the major theologians. The Bishop of Chaldon, Pontus de Teilhard, quote, from the holy Egyptian school has descended to us the secret doctrine and salutary knowledge of the ternary number so greatly revered that the essence of the world is entirely attributed to its disposition, number, weight, and measure, a secret which the Magi understood under the three gods whom you've named. The bishop of Ivreux, uh, who later became a cardinal, by the way, Jacques du Perron, emphasizes that the capitalistic doctrine of the three worlds, the intelligible, the celestial, and the visible, can all be brought together under the Kabbalah. And in examining his book on the French Academies, our author, this book, quotes him as praising these writings of Hermes. Now there's also Protestant, Philippe du Polices Morain, a Protestant author who makes use of Hermeticism He's undertaking a work for religion through studying the world as a shadow of the splendor of God and man as made in the image of God. Moraine, Mornay is an example of how men were returning to the hermetic religion of the world 
to make them above these conflicts going on at the time, and as a possible way to escape from the agonies inflicted by the fanatical use of force by both sides in the war between the Protestants and the Catholics. Now, in Italy, we have someone quite interesting. Razzelli, an Italian Capuchin. Well, no, let me skip that. He's interesting, but I'd rather go on to Patrizzi. Franco Patrizzi, 16th century. Of course, all of these people are 16th century. Patrizzi It's a rather to mention to um, uh, Randolph Scott. Okay, Patrizzi seems to have been impelled by a genuine enthusiasm to take upon himself the task of bringing about a restoration of a true religion. And he regarded the Hermetica as one of the most effective instruments that could be used in this design. He outlined this scheme in his works, first published in 1591 and dedicated to Pope Gregory the Fourteenth, a new universal philosophy. Patrizzi published the Hermeticum, the Corpus Hermeticum, using the Greek text of Turnibus. Patrizzi thus made available in this volume as the foundation of his new philosophy a larger collection of Hermetica than hitherto been assembled. Patrizzi believed that Hermes Trismegidius was a little earlier than Moses, and Moses' account of creation must be supplemented by the account of the uh, uh, Pymander, that Hermes spoke much more clearly of the mystery of the Trinity than Moses did. And this is his understanding, Patrizzi's. Her, her, yet Hermes said that without philosophy it's impossible to, to be pious, and therefore Patrizzi has tried to discover a truer philosophy by which we might return to God. He hopes that the Pope and his successors will adopt his religious philosophy and cause it to be taught everywhere. By the way, he also urged that Plato's dialogue should also be taught publicly. Patrizzi, this, yeah, same guy, Patrizzi, yeah. Um, now, this is the note he wrote, and I'd like to just quote it. I would have you then, this is a letter to the Pope, I would have you then, Holy Father, and all future popes, give orders that some of the books which I have named, prominent among them is the Hermeticum, shall be continually taught everywhere, as I have taught them for the last 14 years at Ferrara, and you will thus make all able men in Italy, Spain, and France friendly to the church. And perhaps even the German Protestants will follow uh, their example and return to the Catholic faith. It's much easier to win them back in this way than to compel them by ecclesiastical censure or by secular arms. You should cause this doctrine to be taught in the schools of the Jesuits who are doing such good work. If you do this, great glory will await you among men of future times. And I beg you to accept me as your helper in this undertaking. Patrizzi's new philosophy goes back to Ficino and Pico Mirandola. Excuse me. In uh, Patrizzi was called to the to Rome by Pope Clement VIII to teach the Platonic philosophy in the university. Later, of course, he was forbidden to leave his home, and he was put on ice for a while. Okay, no, that's enough, right? All right. Would you agree this literature, Hermetic philosophy, primarily the Hermetic, based on Hermes Trismegidius, was accepted by many of the leading churchmen? It promised a whole new way of looking at it. It was able to bring about the thought that maybe they could reconstitute Christianity and settle the great wars between Protestant and Catholics at the time of the Reformation, Counter-Reformation. Now, now, we do a little reading. 
and I gave you copies. I want to read from three or four, just a short section in each so that we can have a little uh, time to reflect and talk about it. Right? Now, put yourself then in the Middle Ages. This is new literature coming into Europe for the first time. It's seen as having its origin at the same time as Moses, or indeed Moses himself. Written by Hermes Trismegidus. Hermes, of course, is the name of Hermes, uh, the messenger of the gods, and Trismegidus is thrice great, three times great. Once upon a time, when I had begun to think about the things that are and my thoughts had soared high aloft while my body senses had been put under restraint by sleep, yet not such sleep as that of men weighed down by fullness of food or by bodily weariness, weariness methought there came to me a being of vast and boundless magnitude who called me by my name and said to me, what do you wish to hear and see and to learn and come to know by thought? Who are you? I said. I, said he, am Poinmandres, the mind of the sovereignty. I would fain learn, I said I, the things that are and understand their nature and get knowledge of God. These, I said, are the things of which I wish to hear. He answered, I know that you wish, I know what you wish, for indeed I am with you everywhere. Keep in mind all that you desire to learn, and I will teach you. When he had thus spoken, forthwith all things change in aspect before me, and were opened out in a moment. And I beheld a boundless view. All was changed into light, a mild and joyous light, and I marveled when I saw it. And a little while there had come to be one part, in one part a downward-tending darkness, terrible and grim. And hereafter I, I saw the darkness changing into a watery substance which was unspeakably tossed about and gave forth smoke as from fire. And I heard it making an indescribable sound of lamentation. For there was set forth from it an inarticulate cry. But from the light there came forth a holy word, which took its stand upon the watery substance. And we thought this word was the voice of the light. And Point Mandries spoke to me to hear and said to me, do you understand the meaning, the meaning of what you have seen? Tell me its meaning, I said, and I shall know. That light, he said, is I, even mind, the first God, who was before the watery substance which appeared out of the darkness. And the word which came forth from the light is Son of God. How so, said I. Learn my meaning, <clears throat> said he, by looking at what you yourself have in you. For in you too the word is son, and the mind is father of the word. They are not separate from the other, for life is the union of word and mind. Said I, for this I thank you. <clears throat> Now fix your thought upon the light, he said, and learn to know it. And when he had thus spoken, he gazed long upon me, eye to eye, so that I trembled in this, re in this aspect. And when I raised my head again, I saw in my mind that the light consisted of innumerable powers and had come to be an ordered world, but a world without bonds. This I perceived and thought, seeing it by reason of the word which Point Mandres had spoken to me. And when I was amazed, he spoke again and said to me, You have seen in your mind the archetypal form, which is prior to the beginning of things, 
and is limitless. Thus spoke Thymandres to me. But tell me, said I, whence did the elements of nature come into being? He answered, they issued from God's purpose, which beheld that beauteous world and copied it. The watery substance, having received the word, was fashioned into an ordered world, the elements being separated out from it. And from the elements came forth the brood of living creatures. Fire unmixed leapt forth from the watery substance and rose up aloft. The fire was light and keen and active. Herewith the air too being light followed the fire and mounted up till it reached the fire parting from earth and water so that it seemed that the air was suspended from the fire. And the fire was encompassed by a mighty power and was held fast and stood firm but earth and water remained in, in their own place, mingled together so as not to be. But they were kept in motion by reason of the breath-like word which moved upon the face of the water. And the first mind, the mind which is life and light, being bisexual, gave birth to another mind, a maker of things. And this second mind, made out of fire and the air, seven administrators who encompass with their orbits the world perceived by the senses, and their administration is called destiny. Forthwith, the word of God leapt up from the downward tending elements of nature to the pure body which had been made and was united with, the, with mind and, and mind the maker, and the word was of one substance with that mind, and the downward tending elements of nature were left devoid of reason so as to be mere matter. And mind, the maker, worked together with the word, and encompassing the orbits of the administrators and whirling them around with a rushing movement, sent circling the bodies he had made, let them revolve, let them revolve, traveling from no fixed starting point to no determined goal, for their revolution begins where it ends. And nature, even as mind the maker willed, brought forth from the downward tending elements animals devoid of reason, for she no longer had with her the word. The air brought forth birds and water and fishes, the earth and the water had by this time been separated from one another, and the earth brought forth four-footed creatures and creeping things beasts wild and tame. But the mind, the father of all, he who is life and light gave birth to man, a being like to himself. And he took delight in man as being his own offspring, for man was very goodly to look on, bearing the likeness of his father. With good reason then did God make, take delight in man, for it was God's own form that God took delight in. God delivered over to man all things that he had made, that he had made. Oh, this goes on, doesn't it? Right. So I'd like to now, I'm going to jump to 10. Just the 10th one, okay? All right. And altogether, they're 18. Just read a few lines of this one. Yeah, right The teaching which I gave yesterday, Asclepius, I dedicated to you. And it's only right that I should dedicate to Tat that which I am about to give today, for it's an abridgment of the general discourses which I have addressed to him. Know then, Tat, that God the Father is of one nature with the good, or rather, the working of God the Father is one with the working of the good. 
Nature is a term applied to birth and growth, and birth and growth have to do with things subject to change and movement. But God's working has to do with things free from change and movement, that is, with things divine. And it is God's will that what is human should be divine. Of forces at work, divine and human, I have spoken elsewhere. And in dealing with our present topic, as well as with other matters, you must bear in mind what I have taught you concerning them. Now, the, the force with which God works is his will. And his very being consists in willing the existence of all things. What else is God the Father but the being of all things, when as yet they are not? It is this that contributes, that cons pardon me, it is this that constitutes the existence of things that are. Such then is God, such is the Father. And to him pertains the good. For the good is a thing that pertains to none save God alone. It's true that the, the cosmos also is father of things which are good insofar as they partake of the good. But the cosmos is not in like measure with God. The author of that is good in living things. For the cosmos is not the author of their life. Or if it acts as an author of life, it does so only under the compulsion imposed on by God's will, without which nothing comes into being. I'm skipping. For it's the property of the good that it becomes known. To him who is able to see it, I'll just skip now and go to just the next one, 11. But I will not shrink from speaking as the thought has come to me. Many men have told me many and diverse things concerning the universe and God, and yet I have not learnt the truth. I ask you, therefore, Master, to make this matter clear to me. You and you alone, I shall believe, if you will show me the truth about it. Mind answers mind hearken then my son and I'll uh, tell you how things are as to God and the universe look upon things through me contemplate the cosmos as it lies before your eyes that body which no harm can touch the most ancient of all things yet ever in its prime and ever new so too the seven subject worlds marshaled in everlasting order and filling up the measure of everlasting time as they run their diverse courses. Now all things are filled with light, but nowhere is there fire. For by the friendship of contraries and the blending of things alike, the fire of heaven has been changed into light, which is shed on all below by the working of the sun. And the sun is the begetter of all good, the ruler of all ordered movement and the governor of the seven worlds. Look at the moon who outstrips all the other planets in her course, the instrument by which birth and growth are wrought, the worker of change in the matters here below. No, I'm skipping. For why should it be thought strange for God to make both what is immortal and, and what is mutable when you yourself do so many different things? You see, you speak, you hear, you smell, feel, touch, walk, think, breathe. It is not one that sees, another that hears, another that speaks. It is not one that feels by touch and another that smells, another that walks, another that thinks, another that breathes but he does all these things is one. Nay, it's not possible for God to exist without doing what I say he does. You, if you ceased to do the things I spoke of, you're no longer a living being. Even so, God, if he ceases to do his work, no longer God. Ah, go to the next one. Mind, my son, Tat, is the very substance of God. If indeed there is a substance of God, and of what nature that substance is, God alone knows precisely. Mind, then, is not severed from the substantiality of God, but is, so to speak, spread around from that source 
just as the light of the sun is spread abroad. In man, mind is. Hence, some men are divine, and the humanity of such men is nearer to the deity. This teaching, Father, is divine. It is both true and helpful. But there is yet another thing which I must uh, ask you to explain. You said that in the irrational animals and the mind works the way of instinct and cooperating with other impulses. Now, now he wants to know about how the mind functions through impulses and desires. <clears throat> Twelve, a new one, Discourse of Hermes. Necessity and providence and nature are the instruments by means of which the cosmos is governed and by means of which matter is set in order. Now this whole cosmos, which is a great God, and an image of him who is greater and is united with him and maintains its order in accordance with the Father's will, is one mass of life. And there is not anything in the cosmos, nor has been through all time, but from the very foundation of the universe. Thirteenth discourse, secret discourse of Hermes. In your general discourses, Father, you spoke in riddles and did not make your meaning clear when you were discussing the divinity of man. You said that no one can be saved until he has been born again, but you did not make known to me what you meant by this. After your talk with me, I besought you to let me learn the doctrine of rebirth as this was uh, the one part of your teaching that I didn't know. But you did not think fit to transmit it to me at that time. You said when you're ready, when you're ready to alienate yourself from the world, then I'll teach it to you. I am now prepared to receive it. I have alienated the thoughts of my heart from the world's deceptions, and I entreat you to s supply what is lacking to me, as you said you would, when you promised to transmit the rebirth to me. I know not, thrice greatest one, from what womb in man can be born again, nor from what seed. Hermes, my son, the womb is wisdom, conceiving in silence, and the seed is the true God, is the true good. And who is it, Father, that begets? I am wholly at a loss, Hermes. The will of God, my son, is the begetter. Tut, tell me this too. Who is the ministrant by whom the, the consummation of the rebirth is brought to pass? Hermes. Some man who is a son of God working in subordination to God's will. That's what. And what manner of man is that? Is he that brought into being, that's brought into being by rebirth? Hermes. He that is born by that birth is another. He is a God, son of God. He's the all and is an all. And he has no part in corporeal substance. He partakes of the substance of things intelligible, being wholly composed of powers of God. Tat, your words are riddles, Father. You do not speak to me as a father to his son, Hermes. This sort of thing cannot be taught, my son. But God, when he, when he so wills, recalls it to our memory. Tat. But what you say is impossible, Father. It, it does violence to common sense. Why do you treat me thus? I have good reason to ask. Am I an alien to my father's race? 
Do not grudge me this boon, Father. I, I am your true son. Explain to me what matter of thing the rebirth is, Hermes. What can I say, my son? This thing cannot be taught. It's not possible for you to see it with the organs of your sight, which are fashioned out of material elements. I can tell you nothing but this. I see that by God's mercy there has come to be in me a form which is not fashioned out of matter, and I have passed forth out of myself and entered into an immortal body. I am not now the man I was. I have born again in mind. The bodily shape which, which was mine before has been put away from me. I am no longer an object colored and tangible, a thing of spatial dimensions. I am now alien to all of this and to all that you perceive when you gaze with your bodily sight. To such a, eyes as yours, I am not now visible. Tat, Father, you've driven me to a raving madness. Will you tell me that I am not at this very moment? Pardon, pardon me. Father, you have driven me to raving madness. Will you tell me that I do not at this moment see my own self? Hermes, with that you too, my son, have passed forth out of yourself so that you might have seen, not as men dreaming in their sleep, but as one awake. Now indeed, Father, why have you reduced me to that speechless amazement? Why I see you, Father, with your statue unchanged and your features the same as ever, Hermes. Even in this, you're mistaken. And so the dialogue goes on. Now, interesting literature? A whole bunch of it. A whole bunch of it. This was the common property for several hundred years. As people tried to take this, they saw it as something very powerful. Some of these bishops, by the way, I didn't read the quote, but I can get you for them if you'd like, even saw that it could reconstitute Christianity into a more noble religion. That around this literature you could build all of the writings and all of the teachings. Now, there's another writing I'd like to read to you, just a couple of lines, so that I can bring you to a Asclepius. Now, the two Asclepiuses, one, of course, is uh, from Madura, uh, Asclepius of Madura. He wrote the great work called The Golden Ass, which is really an absolutely delightful novel and philosophically important, especially the latter part where it talks about the initiation into the mysteries of Isis and describes it in great detail. It's one of the primary sources of the Egyptian religion. But I want to talk about Asclepius, which is hermetic. All right? Okay. Trismegistus is speaking. Trismegistus. This is the prologue to the holy book of Hermes Trismegistus, addressed to Asclepius. Asclepius, pardon me. It is God that has brought you to me, Asclepius, to hear a teaching which comes from God. My discourse will be of such a nature that by reason of its pious fervor, it will be rightly deemed that there is in it more of God's working than in all that I have spoken before, or rather that God's power has inspired me to speak. And if you understand my words and thereby come to see God, your mind will be wholly filled with all things good. If indeed there are many goods, and not rather one good, in which all goods are comprised. For we find that these two things agree with one another. They are so linked together that it's impossible to part them. But this you'll learn from my discourse today, if you'll listen with earnest attention. But go forth for a moment, Asclepius, and summon Tat to join us. When Tat had entered, Asclepius proposed that Amon should also 
be present. Trismegidius replied, I do not grudge permission to Ammon to be with us, for I bear in mind that many of my writings have been addressed to him, and as again many of my treaties on nature, and a very large part of my explanatory writings have been addressed to Tab, my dear living son. As for our discussion today, I will inscribe on it your name, Asclepius. I'm going to skip to those writings now. Trismegidius, he starts, all human souls, Asclepius, are immortal. But souls are not all of one kind. Different souls have been created in different fashions, for souls differ in quality. Man is a marvel. Honor and reverence to such a being. Man takes on him the attributes of a god as though he were himself a god. He is familiar with the demonic kind, for he comes to know that he is sprung from the same source as they and strong in the assurance of that in him which is divine. He scorns the merely human part of his own nature. How far more happily blended are the properties of man than those of other beings. He's linked to the gods inasmuch as there is in him a divinity akin to theirs. Just go skip a couple of, a couple of pages. And Um, and now, Asclepius, I desire you to listen with a strong effort of thought as well as with keen penetration to that which I am about to expound to you. It is a doctrine which the many do not believe, but which should be accepted as sound and true by men of saintlier mind. Thus I begin. God, the master of eternity, is first. Cosmos, second. Man, third. God, the maker of the cosmos and of all things that are therein, governs all things, but has made man as a composite being to govern in connection with him. And if man takes upon him in all of its fullness the function assigned to him, that is, the tendance, which is his special task, he becomes the means of right order to the cosmos and to the cosmos to him. So that it seems the cosmos has been rightly so named because man's composite structure has been thus ordered by God. Man knows himself and knows the cosmos also, provided that he bears in mind what action is suited to the part he has to play and recognizes what things he is to use for his own ends and to what things in turn to do service, rendering praise, thanks in full measure to God. You can go anywhere and get this level of thought. So this was very powerful literature. It came in. Right? It had a great effect on Europe. And then... Isaac Casabandu came along. Greek scholar. And he said, after making an analysis of these texts, he said, this basic assumption that you're making is false. They don't have the same source. As a matter of fact, it's very likely that they were written, he gave 100 A.D. to 400 A.D. Some scholars today push it back to 100 B.C. to 300 A.D., but that's a minor difference. And he said, these writings are made up partly from the writings of Plato and the Platonists and partly from Christian sacred books 
the whole assumption that these writings could have possibly have been written at the time of Moses must be rejected because the language is late, the ideas can be found only in later thinkers, there's nothing to suggest that these early thinkers had all that material and didn't use it until many, many, many hundreds of years later. Therefore, it's unlikely that it's genuine. All right, now you have two traditions, separate and distinct. They no longer printed the writings of the Hermetic literature. They weren't, for the most part. Only a few editions were preserved. No new printings that went through 16 printings. Stopped silence. This literature then went into a new movement in Europe called the Rosicrucians, and that began the foundation of the Rosicrucian movement. So what do we have here, you see? Because they thought this literature was linked, intimately linked, with Christian and Jewish sources, that it was therefore acceptable, it can be used widely and freely in schools and to bring about a transformation of the Christian religion. Once they recognized, therefore, that this was, therefore, nothing other than competitive, they dropped it. Just like they later dropped Dionysius's writings, which we've already gone into, the Chaldean oracles. Chaldean oracles were thought to have been written by Zoroaster, who was, they thought, contemporary with Moses and therefore legitimate. That was dropped too. Asclepius, the Golden Ass, very few people even read anymore, but it's a great story. But it isn't part of the text, textual basis for training and educating Christians. Asclepius, therefore, and Hermes Trismegidius fell into silence. And now the only solution is, why not use what they've rejected? Why do we have to be bound, bound by the fact that these are pagan writings or anti-Christian or anti-whatever you want to call it? Why not accept it as some of the greatest literature that has passed in, into Western Europe through the ages? Why not accept it as part of a philosophical tradition and the wisdom tradition? Why reject it? What they've rejected, let's pick up. Thank you. How about some, what was it like reading it? Tell me, what was it like reading it? Amazing. Yeah. Now, this, all of this can be had, this is available, right, in a book called Hermetica by W. Scott. It's a two-volume work. This is volume one, Texts and Translations. And I would very much like you to know that there is a very, very fine author by the name of Francis Yates, who's done a whole series of books dealing with this issue. And this one I was quoting from is Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. She's done an amazing work on the art of memory. Unfortunately, uh, doesn't give the details of how to do it, but gives you the whole background and a nice theoretical discussion in general about it, and therefore it's very, very important. And she did the book on um, a uh, very fine study on the very subject we're going to go into later, which is the impact that this literature had on the Elizabethan age. Because once this, therefore, was shown to be pagan and not, not in principle capable be, of being reconciled with Christian literature, it was dropped, dropped out of the schools. It fell into a period of silence. And that's where we are pretty much today. So it was like going through it. Very fine. Isn't that fine? Yeah. Very well developed, nice style, nice dialogue, isn't it? Very interesting literature, yeah. I, I enjoy it, I, I enjoy that stuff. Yeah. 
So the next time you're thinking of sending a Christmas gift, you know, send a copy of Hermes, Trismegidius' stuff to some of your friends. Right? Right. So, now the contemporary opinion is these people were Platonists or Neoplatonists, <coughs> and they were trying to fashion and save a good deal and transmit a good deal of the Platonic tradition into the Christian uh, communities, and therefore they used it through these dialogues, and they uh, were very much involved in trying to find a way to bring a spiritual basis using mind into Christianity rather than belief. And that later became heretical, once it, especially once it was discovered that the dates were all wrong. What do you see as the future of Christianity? Well, I don't think they've discovered what it is yet. What Christianity is? No, that's not a, that's not a mischievous statement. Um, see, all of this was thought at one time to be Christianity. See? They all thought it was. And what's happened is that each of these pieces have been rejected so that we could really make it something like this. So much has been rejected. Right? It was a very full tradition. And now what's left the theologians are arguing about, see they're trying to find out what it is to be a Christian and they want to make that so clear in their minds so they can therefore use that for evangelical purposes. Now when they've thrown all of this out, then they're just left with the New Testament. That's all they've got. And now they're battling to see whether the seven parts of the New Testament can be reconciled together. Of course it can't be because they're written by seven different authors with different purposes and no one has ever been able to bring it all together. So now different parts of this seven are some scholars drop this part out, others drop that part out, so they're going, well, in the end, they won't have anything. They won't have anything. But there's no reason why they can't reconstitute the canon. This is the real problem, because we now have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right? We now have the Nag Hammadi Library with 54 volumes of this literature that everyone thought was gone and forgotten, of, destroyed, gone, lost. <clears throat> Why not take, go back and say, look here, let's forget this battle of trying to be pure Christians. Let's try to express that thought by going back and seeing whether we can bring together this material, this material, all of this material into a unity. Let's not reject things because it doesn't fit someone's theological prejudice. Right? No more dumping. Let's use the mind in reconstituting Christianity. And that, of course, is the very spirit of my good friend, Patrizzi. He's the man to look at if you're looking at this idea. This is Patrizzi's idea. Look here, we need a new philosophy. We don't want to reject anything. We want to take everything that's spiritually significant, especially open to the mind, and bring it together into a new unity. Look what will it do for the arts. Look what will it do for all of the forms, the visible forms we have. Look how it can reopen the whole dialogue. Look how it can reach out to all men with diverse backgrounds. Open up the mind. Be a nice thing, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you have nothing else to do, do it. I'm busy, otherwise I'd be doing it. <laughs> yeah, I've got work to do. You guys do it. Yeah, that's enough being a philosopher. Yes, you were going to say? Good, good. Uh, it strikes me that the, the greatest dog that, that fights that is the concept of the Old Testament as being a literal story. Well, we should do the, yeah, we should do the Old Testament, especially Ben Sira. There's a whole development of the Old Testament that, uh, we ought to put that, we, we, I haven't put that in yet. Yeah, we ought to put that in. So if we're fed the Old yeah. Testament is a literal story, then everything else becomes a confederate false doctrine in a sense, and uh, 
Yeah, there was a crisis in Hebrew thought, uh, uh, to contextually, historically too, <clears throat> where they sided with, my, with uh, the Maccabees, and that split them. But yeah, we can do that. We have to do this. We haven't done this yet. This is left over. And we've done all of this now. Uh, we never do the golden ass. That, that's really, that's really, that's really funny. I mean, that's really great. That's on so many levels, it's funny. Uh, this man, the young man, is out, uh, and he has an interest in philosophy, but he gets interested in a witch's uh, uh, maid, and she's very beautiful. And of course, what he happens to her happens to most people in this kind of a story. And as a consequence, he gets transformed into an ass. And therefore, it's called the golden ass. And the only thing he recognizes of value is when he looks down to see that he has one thing larger than it was before, with which he's very pleased. And that's the story, then, of what he does to kind of trying to reconstitute his man, his humanness. You see, it's a whole story of how to become human, how to stop being an ass. And then the story is how he returns to being human, and that brings him into, in a very nice way, the mystery of Isis. He becomes a priest in the system of uh, Isis. Very lovely story. We haven't done that. We haven't done Picatrix, and we should do also the Old Testament, Ben Sura. Yeah, good, good thought. Yeah, very important man, very important. All right. Okay? Who's Ben Sura? That's, that's right. That's right. That's what we're going to look at at another time. Yeah, very important figure. I'm just wondering if it's our John, our Judah that I'm thinking of. Pardon me? I'm trying to figure out the comparable, there, that there's another mystic character that has a similar experience in that he meets like a figure, a divine figure, and, and asks, is asked, what would you like to know? What questions would you like to have answered? And goes in a pursuit. Point Andrews. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. And, and, but what, isn't oh, there a pair of, is it is it in the Bhagavad Gita where last week. the same? Yes. Yes. Oh, I wasn't doing last week. Yes. Yes. So, but I found what was so interesting was that mm. this one you have to hold on to the question. This one you have to hold on to the question. Right. Because right. that's very that's very platonic in itself. That's right. That's right. Oh my gosh, I didn't. Uh, you oh. read that section to us, but. I, and I, since I wasn't here last week, I didn't realize you'd drawn the parallel. Oh, this is, this is bad news. What didn't, I didn't, uh... Diamond Sutra. Oh, okay, all right, okay. I was going to read it. I wanted to make sure I could read a certain section. Oh, you have another one? Huh? Um, or, to, yes. uh, be toward to the journey in, in uh, Parmenides' poem, right, where yes. they take him as far as his uh -huh. heart's uh -huh. desires, oh, right, quite journey true. through all lands, oh. all cities. Um, it's just interesting that the Godhead has that capacity oh. in each of the traditions. Oh. To the furthest most reach, reach of my desire. Uh -huh. right. I just wanted to read two, two sentences in Point Mandarese, which is the first one I was reading. And being made like to those with whom he dwells, he hears the powers who are above the substance of the eighth sphere, singing praise to God with a voice that is theirs alone. And therefore, thereafter, each in his turn, they mount upward to the Father. They give themselves up to the powers and become powers themselves, they enter into God. This is the good, this is the consummation for those who have gotten gnosis. Wow. So, thank you for joining me this evening. Right.